Loyalty can be demonstrated only in adversity. Think about that. Josh Duggar has been sentenced to more than 12 years in prison on child pornography charges. God's grace can give me the strength to love Josh when others would say he doesn't deserve it. Disgraced reality star Josh Duggar, of 19 kids and counting, was arrested on April 29, 2021, on federal charges of one count of receiving CSAM and one count of possessing CSAM. On December 9, 2021, after a six-day trial, Josh was convicted and found guilty on all charges. The Daily Mail writes, Duggar showed little emotion as he was led away by U.S. Marshals, looking back at Anna and making a heart shape with his hands, which she reciprocated. Anna, his devoted wife of many years and mother to their seven children, was by his side every step of the way. But with the guilty verdict, Anna was set to do life without him. This case represents a significant milestone for the Western District of Arkansas in our continued efforts to combat child abuse. Those who would say that children who are photographed and videoed in a manner similar to the evidence in this case are not abused and are not victims are clearly wrong. Children who are photographed and videoed in manners such as this are the victims. And every time their videos and photos are traded online, uploaded and downloaded from the internet, they are victimized all over again. Every single time that that happens. I said at the beginning that this case was a milestone for our efforts to combat child pornography and child abuse in our district. It's a milestone for a lot of reasons, but a couple of the most important ones that come to mind is that it first and foremost shows that no person is above the law. Regardless of their status in society, regardless of their wealth, regardless of their fame, this case shows that no person is above the law. This case also shows us something else. It shows us that this work is very hard. Upon news of Josh Duggar's conviction, certain members of his family would speak out. The first would be his sister, Jill, and her husband, Derek Dillard. In a statement on their website, they wrote, Today was difficult for our family. Our hearts go out to the victims of child abuse or any kind of exploitation. We are thankful for the hard work of law enforcement, including investigators, forensic analysis, prosecutors, and all others involved who save kids and hold accountable those responsible for their abuse. Jesus warned his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Moreover, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. We have been lied to so much that we wanted to hear the evidence for ourselves in court. After seeing all the evidence as it was presented, we believe that the jury reached a just verdict today consistent with the truth beyond a reasonable doubt. Josh's actions have rippled far beyond the epicenter of the offense itself. Children have scars, but his family is also suffering the fallout of his actions. Our hearts are sensitive to the pains Josh's wife, Anna, and their seven children have already endured and will continue to process in the future. This trial has felt more like a funeral than anything else. Josh's family has a long road ahead, we stand with them, we are praying for them, and we will seek to support them however we can during this dark time. Josh's sister Jessa and her husband Ben would follow up with a statement of their own, condemning Josh and supporting the court's judgment. His sisters Ginger and Joanna, along with their husbands, follow suit, expressing the same sentiment in their statements. Amy Duggar, the outspoken cousin of Josh Duggar, would also speak out against the fallen reality star. And finally, Josh's parents, Jim, Bob, and Michelle Duggar, would release a statement on their family website. A couple released a statement tonight saying in part, quote, Today, God's grace through the love and prayers of so many has sustained us. Our hearts and prayers are with anyone who has ever been harmed through child's materials. 
In the days ahead, we will do all we can to surround our daughter-in-law, Anna, and their children with love and support. As parents, we will never stop praying for Joshua and loving him as we do all of our children. It must be noted that at the time of Josh Duggar's conviction, none of his brothers spoke out. The only siblings of Josh that made public statements were Jill, Jessa, Ginger, Joanna, and their husbands. Immediately following his conviction, Josh was taken into custody, where he would await his sentencing. Upon news of the guilty verdict, his lawyers made it very clear that they planned to appeal the judgment. With Josh in jail, Anna and their seven children continued to live on the Duggar property in the warehouse. According to reports, Josh and Anna, along with their children, have been living there since 2020. The Sun wrote, Josh was immediately taken into custody at Washington County Jail, where he was placed in solitary confinement, away from other prisoners for his safety, until his sentencing next year. The Sun can exclusively reveal that while Josh is in jail, his wife Anna, 33, and their seven kids are living in a rundown warehouse on Jim Bob and Michelle's Arkansas compound. A source told The Sun, quote, the night of the sentencing, the lights were on at the warehouse. The SUV parked right outside was the car Anna left court in. According to their belief system, as her husband, Josh was the authority over Anna. As their faith goes, she is not to come out from under that umbrella of authority. However, with Josh in jail, Jim Bob, his father, would step up and become the headship over Anna's life. With no education, job, or financial standing of her own, Anna had to completely rely on the Duggars. Uh, do you think that the criticism of, of Anna is justified? And if you do, why? Why? And if not, why not? The minute that this raid happened, you know, and I'm saying it's like, I'll say me as a parent, because I am a parent, so I can say me as a parent. The minute that this kind of raid happens and the FBI is raiding my, you know, in this example, my husband's, you know, uh, dealership is place of work, you know, or for me in, the, in life, if I found out that my wife and they were raiding and they found all this stuff, you know, am I going to believe instantly, you know, oh, they did it, you know, maybe not. I'll probably be in denial like anybody would. I think with, if they had a track record like Josh's, I'd probably go like, okay, like there's too much here coming one after another. Mm -hmm. But as a parent, I'm getting my kids out of the situation till we know, you know, and, and that to me is what disturbs me about Anna's response. But from all the public responses from her walking in a trial, smiling with Josh, holding his hand, going in, like that to me is inexcusable. That's where if, if there's evidence, like physical evidence of, you know, child, child stuff on your computer you know, you want to get your kids away from this person until you find out if that's true or not, no matter what emotional tie you have to them. And so for me, if Anna stays with him through this, or if Anna stays loyal through this, to me, that's an inexcusable decision. And, you know, that's where, that's where I just can't, my, my grace runs out to this point of like, Okay, now you're actively endangering your kids. And, and I, I'll go back and say that grace for me ran out the minute these supervised visits were happening. Like yeah. to me, if there was any inkling, you know, like, and again, hypothetically, if there was any inkling of this with my spouse who I love and who, you know, we're, I would not let my daughter anywhere in the vicinity until I know. Yes. And, and so that's, to me, that's where I think it is. And, and again, there's people that go like, well, she grew up in this movement or she did that. Many things can be true. I can feel deep sympathy that she was taught horrific things. I can feel deep sympathy. She grew up in a twisted movement with a big spotlight and fill in the blank, but many things can be true. She can also make a really bad decision for her family. And so, you know, that's where I think people lose this is they want to go one way or another and go like, well, that's no excuse. She didn't have any kind of horrific upbringing and she, was, she wasn't taught bad stuff. She's just, that's just her excuse. Well, no, she was. Or they're the other side and say, well, that's what she was taught. And so we can just totally like, you know, go Anna, we, we support you hundred percent. Like I, I support you that you were taught really bad stuff. I don't support you that yeah. you'd, you'd put your kids in a dangerous situation. 
Despite public criticism, Anna planned on standing by Josh. In February 2022, after being silent online for months, Anna resurfaced and posted that there's more to the story. She shared a link to a 27-page document filed by Josh Duggar's defense team requesting an acquittal or a new trial. According to Fox8.com, the filing stated that the defendant was deprived of significant constitutional rights, and because of this, the law requires a new trial. Josh Duggar's defense team addressed the fact that Duggar was prevented from calling a necessary witness, Caleb Williams. In the paperwork, the defense team writes that Duggar sought to call Williams as a witness because he had the opportunity, the know-how, and the motive to commit the charged offenses. And, depending on his responses to questions posed at trial, Williams' credibility was readily impeachable. In short, Duggar sought to introduce evidence that Williams may have lied or been mistaken about his whereabouts at certain times. For context, Caleb Williams was a family friend of the Duggars, who did some freelance work at Josh Duggar's car lot in 2019. Caleb Williams is a registered SO. Josh Duggar's defense team attempted to accuse Caleb of being the one who downloaded and viewed CSAM, not Josh. Despite having a solid alibi, Josh's team attempted to throw Caleb under the bus and take the fall for Josh's crimes. In an interview with Sojo Files, Caleb Williams discusses the situation and shares his story. Hello? So you were the scapegoat for the Josh Duggar trial. I was. It was uh, quite harrowing. And I wasn't super thrilled with the position I was put into. Um, And I was kind of shocked by it, honestly. So I was in close proximity to the Duggars for quite a while. We've been friends for many years now. Um, I was... Uh, I got in trouble a few years ago. I don't need to go into all the details, but um, it left me. Now I am uh, on the um, sex offender registry. I'm required to register, and um, that was probably very attractive to Josh's team. You were already in the clear. Nobody thought that you were in Arkansas at all. So you were already in the clear. However, you semi put yourself in the line of fire by saying, hey, no, I did come to Arkansas to go to this doctor's appointment. But then I immediately left and I went to the Apple store. I've got a receipt from the Apple store. There's security footage from the Apple store that's going to prove I'm there. There's a representative who came down to Arkansas from St. Louis to testify in the event you got called as a witness that No, he was absolutely in St. Louis at the time of this crime, so he could not have done it. But for me, it gave you credibility that you even admitted that you had come to the doctor's appointment because you certainly did not have to put yourself in the line of fire, which you're like, I've got nothing to hide. Yes, I came to Arkansas for this doctor's appointment, but here's proof that when this crime was going on, I was legitimately all the way in St. Louis, which is, what, five or six hours from... Springdale? Five hours. I think. Five hours. And you had mm-hmm. documentation to back it up, as well as an eyewitness who was prepared to testify should you be called. While Josh's legal team prepared for his appeal, he sat in the Washington County Jail awaiting his sentencing. In the hope of getting a light sentence, several of Josh's loved ones wrote character letters to the judge and his father, Michael Keller, and her brother-in-law, David Waller, who was married to her sister, Priscilla, both submitted letters to the judge on Josh's behalf. For context, David Waller was the assistant of former IBLP founder and leader, Bill Gothard. When Bill Gothard stepped down due to allegations of abuse, David took over as director of the IBLP. A survivor featured in the Amazon docuseries, Shiny Happy People, would later name David Waller, as the man who helped conceal Gothard's abuse. Dated March 10th, 2022, David's letter reads, quote, As the senior pastor of Fair Park Baptist Church and as the brother-in-law to Joshua Duggar, I would like you to know that I have met and talked and prayed with Joshua Duggar. 
his precious wife Anna Duggar, and each of their children for many hours. I believe you should carefully consider the many factors that affect the discretion you retain in your power as you set the sentence for Joshua Duggar. Joshua Duggar is a friend and my brother-in-law for the past 10 years. We have spent a considerable amount of time together through family holidays, vacations, working together, and doing projects to help and serve needy people. Here are a few examples. It was Joshua Duggar who offered to help me finish the large deck project for our in-laws. It was his generosity and personal initiative that designed the cable railing system for the deck to keep everyone safe and allow wheelchair access. It was Joshua Duggar's kindness and generosity that has allowed me to purchase vehicles at his cost, including a Honda Pilot that my wife and I enjoy driving. It was Joshua Duggar that went out and spent several hundred dollars to decorate and organize our laundry room to make it efficient and beautiful. I have heard his young sons pray for you, Judge, by name, asking God to work in your heart so their daddy could be home soon. I have also heard them cry themselves to sleep, wanting their daddy to be home. Joshua Duggar is a deeply religious and God-fearing man. He lives his life knowing that he will give an account someday to God for the choices and decisions he makes. He has publicly owned his mistakes and has been transparent about his faults, even when he knows he will be misunderstood, maligned, and attacked. He has also chosen not to own something he claims he has not done. As a pastor who cares about the spiritual condition of people, I urge you to consider how much his wife and seven children need him in their lives, to be nearby for visits, accessible for communication, and brought back home to provide, not just the financial, but spiritual guidance of his family. Sincerely, David Waller. Frankly, it's sad to me because, like I said, I really love the Duggars. Um, I don't, I don't even, I don't, I don't, I still love Josh. Like when at the trial, when I, he looked scared, it, it, I empathize with people a lot. And so I hated that this happened. I understand crime and punishment. I, I get that, but I'm still going to empathize because I see there are so many collateral consequences, so many things, his family, um, his mom and dad. I understand people don't like certain things about what has happened in the past, but they're still a family. They still love their son, his wife. I get it. I don't agree with her on a lot of things, but I still look at and say, wow, that's so painful. His kids. And I have juggled this in my heart and mind. I prayed for him. I have no intention to cause them harm in talking to you tonight. I think really, and we've had this conversation a little bit is it's just to shine light into what's happened here in the last few months and what actually occurred and the time frame that he committed his crime. Anna's father, Michael Keller, would also write a letter to the judge. Michael was key in arranging the courtship and later marriage of Anna and Josh Duggar. In his letter, dated March 1st, 2022, he writes, quote, Hello, my name is Michael Keller, and I have served as a volunteer in the prisons of Florida for over 25 years. I have known Josh Duggar for over 14 years. I have spent a lot of time watching Josh's character over the years. He is very gentle, kind, and polite to everyone I've seen him in contact with. I have never seen him blow up in anger. I have seen Josh many times go the extra mile to keep peace with others. For example, one day, I saw him talking to a man that bought a truck from him two years previous with no warranty. The man's transmission went out on the truck and he asked Josh to help him with the bill. I couldn't believe what I heard. Josh said he would pay half of the transmission bill. Dear Judge Brooks, Please be merciful to this young man that has a wife and seven children that love him and need him. He is truly a fantastic daddy, and he truly loves his family. Sincerely, Michael E. Keller. It's just so sad that there can be a mountain of evidence in front of them, and yet they don't want to see it. They don't want to acknowledge it, and they are just always going to 
assume the best in, in people. And apparently, and, and that would be hard. That's your son. I, and that's your husband. I understand that. But at the same time, you have to realize that he's sick. He has a huge problem, you know, and I have to be very vocal about it. This is one of those things where it, it's not just about Anna's children, even though they're precious, of course, but it's every child I feel like that doesn't have a voice. And so even though I was never a victim, my family is being silent right now, almost all of them. And so for me, it's like, do I just, do I, do I just stay quiet too? Because if I am, if I am quiet and I just, you know, go on my life and everything's hunky dory, people think I'm condoning his behavior and I will never do that. I will always hold, hold him accountable for his actions and what he did. And, and honestly, if you don't talk about it, then you're not getting the message out. You know, you've, it's just, it's just, I, I became a child advocate overnight. I feel like, but it is something that has just, broke my heart. I mean, broke my heart into a million pieces. And as a mama now, I honestly can't imagine. I After sitting in the Washington County Jail since December 2021, Josh was finally sentenced on May 25th, 2022. Judge Timothy Brooks sentenced Josh Duggar to 12 and a half years in federal prison. The judge based his decision off three categories, which is content, community, and conduct. Now, in the content category, the judge mentioned how Duggar had less than 600 images, which he says is significantly lower than the average of more than 4,000. However, the judge says the type of images Duggar had are some of the worst he has seen, saying that he that he could not get some of the images out of his head. And as far as conduct, the judge mentioned how Duggar went to extreme lengths to make sure that his activity was undetectable. He also looked at Duggar's past of physical abuse with children as young as age five. And with community, the judge looked at whether the images were shared, which the judge says Duggar showed those images on the dark web with peers. We know that this sentence isn't going to take away the suffering and the pain that they've already felt from this abuse. But it is our hope that this sentence sheds light on this very dark criminal conduct because every single time these files are traded, shared, and downloaded online, those same children are victimized all over again. As people exited the building, we saw wife Anna Duggar head towards her car. As she entered her car, it was an emotional scene seeing her cry as she entered her vehicle. We also saw Father Jim Bob Duggar exit the building, leaving nothing to say. Excuse me, do you have any comments for tonight, sir? Anything about today's account outcomes? You guys didn't get the five years you wanted. How are, how are you guys reacting to that? Apologies. Upon Josh's sentencing, his sisters once again weighed in, expressing contentment with the judgment. In addition to his sisters, one of his brothers would come forward and speak out, which was a rarity. His younger brother, Jason, posted the following message on Instagram. Quote, In my opinion, Judge Timothy L. Brooks was fair in his ruling, giving Josh a sentence that would be considered below the median for the crimes he has committed. My heart is grieved over the choices my brother has made. His actions do not reflect that of a Christian believer and have doubtlessly defamed my Lord and Savior's name. Joshua's poor decisions have greatly affected those around him, in particular, his wife, seven children, and our family as a whole. I will never stop loving my brother, regardless of what he does. Just as my Savior has forgiven me, so I have forgiven my brother." of his wrongdoings. My prayer is that God will use this circumstance to truly humble him and bring about a true change in his life. Amy King Duggar would once again weigh in, this time writing an open letter to Anna, offering her support and encouragement during this difficult time. Her letter read, quote, Anna, I feel for you. No woman wants to be in your shoes. 
you're faced with an impossible decision and you're being surrounded by the wrong kind of support. You've been taught since you were a child that marriage is forever and you prayed for God to send you a partner. You've constructed a life and a family with him. You didn't choose any of this and your kids certainly didn't either. I'm not coming after you with some sort of tough love thing. This is what's simply on my heart and I can't help but to express it. I cried as I read the letter your own father wrote in support of your husband this week. It's no wonder you're struggling to know what to do to protect your own kids. You've obviously never had an example there. That's awful, and I'm so sorry for that. But my mom was a fierce protector, and so am I. She showed me how to stand up and speak up. If no one else in your life is saying it, I need you to understand that there is no shame in divorcing Josh. Someday, your kids will be old enough to understand what kind of guy their father really is. You can't protect them from the truth forever. I'm saying all of this publicly so that when they do grow up, they will also know that they have family members shouting from the rooftops that they were worth protecting all along. Your children look up to you so much. Please be the role model they need in their life. Dylan and I are more than willing to help you. Josh has chosen how history will remember him. By staying and supporting him, you're allowing him to choose that for you too. And I know standing up to all of this seems impossible now, but as a mama, your instinct to protect your kids always has to be stronger than your fear. The only people you would upset by leaving are the ones willing to sacrifice you and your children's safety to protect Josh and his secrets. At Anna Duggar, from a mama who won't turn a blind eye. The marriage that you have endured, I'll put it like, um, isn't true love. It's not true love. Love doesn't hurt like that. Um, and I've reached out. I've tried. I've tried. It breaks my heart to think about it, honestly, because I've tried. I've tried um, Instagram. I've tried Twitter. I've tried email. I text. I've tried calling. I don't know if her phone's being monitored, monitored, and I don't know if there's control, like we were talking about too with IVLP, but on that as well. Um, you pray that away. You can't pray that type of sickness away. Um, and it's just so sad because. I am here to help. I, I am here. Like Dylan and I, I just told another interviewer that I was, that I was talking about. I literally told them, I said, I have room at my house right now for all of your children and you, I, we would help you. We would, you know, you're not just alone in this world. There are people that love you and want to protect your children. And you. Yeah, I've tried. <laughs> I'm kind of at the end of my rope here. You know, you can't help someone that doesn't want help. That's true. Um, what do you think it is about the IBLP that keeps people so strongly in this organization? Because I feel like from an outsider looking in, it, it, you can't really understand it, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, you're taught, I, I honestly say at a very, very young age that you do not divorce no matter what, no matter what you're engraved in this, right? All, every teaching, everything you read, I mean, on stop. So when you get to the age of time to be married in court, you know, without a shadow of a doubt that you are not going to divorce that person, no matter what happens to your children, no matter what happens to you. And that is so wrong. And so it's not even biblical. Let's just talk about that. You know, it's not even true scripture being taught. Um, and so, yeah, I think the IBLP does just hold, like, hold you. It's a rain. They hold you. And you can't, you can't break away from it in your head because of what you've been taught your whole life. And do you think that's why maybe Anna is staying with Josh after everything that's happened? I mean, I hate to say it, but absolutely. I I think that has a major play in in why she's not 
doing something about it um, or breaking free or asking questions or, you know, just anything. I don't know. I, I haven't talked to her in such a long time. I want to speak for her, but mm-hmm. it's, it looks that way. Upon his sentencing, Josh will be moved to Siegelville Federal Correctional Institute in Texas. Though Anna lived on the Duggar compound in Arkansas, she would go and visit Josh in Texas regularly, with it being reported that she drove six hours to Texas to see him every other weekend. According to reports, Anna sent Josh books on relationships, put money on his commissary account, ran his businesses back in Arkansas, and took care of their seven children. Though Anna had a support system in Arkansas, she wanted to be closer to Josh and discuss moving there, something he was highly against. The Ashley writes, quote, Anna is currently looking for a home for her and the kids that is close to the prison. However, Josh, who recently filed an appeal, is unhappy that Anna is planning a move to Texas. A source told the Ashley the following, he thinks he is going to beat his appeal and feels his wife's move is unnecessary, he tends to think they are going to reverse his case. Josh and Anna had a dispute on the phone, and Josh went days without talking to her, which is big because he calls every day. Anna seems tired, broken, and worn out during her visits with Josh. His actions appear to have really affected her. Loyalty can be demonstrated only in adversity. Think about that. Think about what that teaches. Teaches you that you have no way out. And no matter what they do, loyalty will shine through in adversity. How messed up is that? Be loyal to God, be loyal to your parents and that authority, and be willing to love your spouse, even when it hurts. Can we come in, Anna? You think 12 years is fair, Anna? This comes up with Anna Duggar a lot. Why can't she just leave? Oh, just let's take a look at why she just can't leave. Okay, so she was raised without an education. She was chosen for Joshua Duggar. Her duty is to him to be pleasing in every way, always, even if he's not there. She has a bevy of children with him. We all out here know that somebody like that would find resources. She'd have a book deal so fast, but she doesn't know that. She probably doesn't know the truth of her situation. Josh was my first love. He's my one and only. My only hope was to cling to my faith because I think in the stun and in the shock of everything, I was just praying God help, help me to know how to respond to all of this. Young, idealistic people <laughs> can get tangled up in that stuff all of the time, as I know firsthand. According to inside sources, Anna was suffering a lot. Not only was she in conflict with her husband, but she was also in conflict with his family. Media news outlets reported that in December of 2022, there was tension between Anna and the older Duggar siblings, particularly the ones who spoke out about Josh's case. According to reports, Anna was upset that some of her in-laws believed Josh was guilty while she believes he's innocent. In January of this year, Anna was photographed taking all seven of their children to visit Josh at Siegelville. OK Magazine writes, months into a sentence, a family member of a fellow inmate revealed the disgraced reality star's wife, Anna, is often seen visiting him at the Texas prison with their children, despite the nature of Josh's conviction. Quote, we've seen Anna at the visitation fairly regularly. I've spoken to Anna a couple of times the relative reportedly said in a recent interview. Normally, the only thing I've seen is Anna and then their kids. I don't know anybody else. Up until a couple of weeks ago, they actually allowed inmates and visitors to hold hands. It was really lovely. But they rotated another guard onto the shift, and now they're not allowing that anymore, continued the source. Though Anna had been a constant support for Josh, the amount of support she could give him would soon change. When sometime around January or February of this year, Josh was caught with an illegal phone in prison. In Touch Weekly reported, Josh Duggar has been placed in solitary confinement for allegedly possessing a cell phone in prison. The conditions of the facility's solitary confinement area are notoriously bad. Hi. Okay, so we just have a couple questions to 
the jail that is holding Josh. The prison. In, well, in prison. Yes. Okay. One, how did he get a cell phone? Yeah. Two. What was he looking at? Ooh, I don't even want to know that. Three, what did he do to get the cell phone? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And four, what was the fourth one? Who gave him the cell phone? Yes. Question, question. According to The Sun, a former prisoner at Siegelville told the Ashley, quote, cell phones are hot commodities in prison. Certain inmates get them and then basically rent them out to the other guys. If they're caught and the phone gets taken away, the guy who rented it is responsible for paying the owner for it. That would usually be around $1,800 to $2,000. So it's possible that Josh would need to figure out how to pay it back. According to news media outlets, Josh would spend 75 days in solitary confinement. Upon his release in March of this year, Josh faced additional consequences for his actions. According to The Sun, Josh cannot have visitors for 180 days and will not have access to the phone. They write, That means Josh can't talk to his wife for 180 days. Additionally, he isn't allowed to have any commissary for the same length of time. Perhaps the most jarring repercussion to Josh's illegal cell phone issue, however, is that his release date has been changed. Initially, Josh was scheduled to be released in August of 2032. Now it's in October. With Anna now unable to visit Josh or talk to him, things were beginning to take a toll on her. A source told In Touch the following, quote, Anna has been constantly praying about their marriage amid his prison sentence and subsequent appeal. Anna is still very much questioning their future. She took her wedding vow seriously, and she wants to stand by her man and all that. But the reality of her situation is very difficult. Anna wants Josh by her side as a husband and as a father to their children. However, it isn't physically possible for now or the near future. Divorce is not something she wants, but she'd be lying if she says she hasn't questioned her future with Josh. Anna married Josh for better or worse, and it can't get any worse than this. But for Anna, things would get worse when sermons of her father surfaced in June of this year. Anna's dad, Michael Keller, is seen preaching at Fair Park Baptist Church, where David Waller, who's married to her sister Priscilla, is pastor. Here are some clips of his sermons that have now gone viral. Take a look. Before they dropped that bomb, they sent millions of flyers in Japanese saying, get out of this city now. It's We're going to drop a big bomb. Everybody's going to die. Get out, get out, get out. Most of the people laugh. They thought it was a joke. But about 50 people or so decided, hey, um, maybe we should just visit grandma 50 miles away, you know, <laughs> just in case. Boom, you know. So our government called Japan after the bombing and said, hey, we got a lot of these bombs. Are you ready to surrender? Oh, that's what's a big bomb. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can negotiate a surrender. Oh, no, 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 no. Unconditional surrender or nothing. Ah, oh, no. Nah. I get to think about this. We'll talk later. Boom. After the second bomb, the dear Japanese people had this sweet attitude. They surrender. That's salvation. You got to surrender your life to Jesus by faith. The one sin you got to repent of, I believe it covers everything. The sin of being the boss of your life and the boss of your future. Let, repent from that. And um, what happened after the war? We were nice to the Japanese people. And God blessed us for that. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Well, what did we get out of being nice to those guys? They weren't nice to us. They were cruel. We got a lot of good things. They're called Hondas, Toyotas, and Nissans. Or 200 years ago, when the blacks were slaves, did they ever go to Washington, D.C. and have a rally 200 years ago to protest against slavery? Did they? No. What did they do? Well, a lot of good people in the plantations would say, hey, it's winter time. Let's ha let us help 
build a church for you, dear folks. And they loved them and taught them how to read so they can read the Bible. And here's what the blacks did about 150 years ago. They humbled themselves. They prayed. They sought God's face and they turned from their wicked ways. And God made slavery illegal through a several white presidents, right? It worked, didn't it? The husband's been buying prostitutes. Nah, uh, yow! Anyway, and, and they want me to counsel, help this family. Huh? I don't jump in quick. We prayed, my wife and I, we prayed and prayed and prayed, Lord, give us wisdom how to help this family. And you know, my wife says it's so sweet. She said, full forgiveness, true forgiveness, also involves releasing the person from probation. And she said, wow, that's hard. Michael Keller's sermons would offer the public insight into Anna's upbringing and the ideals instilled in her. Around the time that his sermons went viral, reports would come out that Anna had been kicked out of the Duggar home and had relocated to Texas. News media outlets would allege that upon Josh's sentencing, Anna and the Duggars had constant discord. They allege that she not only had issues with some of the older Duggar siblings, but that she also had issues with Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar, as she blamed them for the way Josh, quote, turned out. Reports allege that Anna felt that Jim Bob and Michelle didn't properly handle his previous SA incidents, which resulted in the progression of his behavior. According to reports, after a heated argument in June of this year, Jim Bob asked Anna to leave the compound. Media outlets allege that Anna, along with her seven children, fled to Texas, where she would not only be closer to Josh, but also have the support of her sister Priscilla and husband David, as well as fellowship from their church. It's important to note that all of this is alleged, as Anna has not come forward to confirm anything. At this time, this is speculation, rumors, and hearsay. Though Anna has not been seen nor photographed in months, that would soon change. When on August 4th of this year, Amy King Duggar ran into the mom of seven in Arkansas. Upon their interaction, here's what Amy had to say. Uh, okay. We have news. Big news. We saw Anna. Mm-hmm. Um, I was hugging my friend's mom and I looked up and she was literally a couple inches away from me. Um, we were at a friend's visitation that passed. Y'all, what does she look like, Mom? Oh my gosh. She looked so angry. Just she looked furious. So ticked at the world. And she's obviously right there in front of me. So I was like, oh, like completely startled by the fact that she was literally, I've been seeing her face after years, you guys. And I said, Anna, and I kind of patted her back and she said, just give me space. That's what she said. We gave her space. We walked away. I gave her space. I didn't, I didn't make it a big deal. Yep. Yeah. Nope. You didn't hug her. And I walked away. So you guys, she knows that I have been talking about her and how I've been trying to reach her, right? She obviously knows that I am putting this out there that Anna, like, you don't have to be alone in this. We're here for you. We're here to protect your children, all of that. But y'all, she love, made it. We, we love Anna. We love oh, the yeah. children. We, we want them to get help. We want them to be free in this crazy nut Bill Gothard thing. I'm telling you. So she made it clear tonight, though, that she does not want our help. Mm -mm. She does not care for our help. And that she's going to do whatever Anna does. And there was a, a little girl with her that was crying, just bawling, bawling her eyes we out. I don't know if it was one of I don't know if it was Jennifer nieces. or if it was her oldest daughter. I'm not sure. But she was bawling her eyes out. And I didn't get it. She, she was like turning her head. So I couldn't really see who it was. But she was bawling her eyes out. And tomorrow's the funeral. Right? Tomorrow was the funeral. So I bet the whole family, family will be there. will be there tomorrow. <laughs> but, you know, you guys, I... I will never stop trying to defend children and try to protect children. And it's just so clear to me that she doesn't need, doesn't want help, which is so unbelievably sad. 
So that's the update. Literally, I was shocked. I couldn't even drive home. My mom had to drive home because I was like, like, uh, I just don't even know what to say. It's a mess. It's a mess. According to Amy, though she had offered support to Anna, Anna was not in a place to receive it. Anna has a lot on her plate at this time because in addition to all of this, Josh's appeal was underway and soon there would be a verdict. Back in February of this year, Josh's attorney, Justin Gelfan, made an oral argument to the court requesting a new trial. In addition to accusing Caleb Williams of being the perpetrator of the crimes, he would accuse the prosecution of being silent on, quote, the real issues, with him stating that the government failed to present sufficient evidence at trial to support the convictions. He asserted that the prosecution deliberately played games and how it disclosed certain emails to the defense during the trial. According to reports, Josh's defense team cited three issues on appeal, but we're going to discuss two of them. One, whether the district court violated Duggar's constitutional right to present a complete defense, precluding Duggar from calling, and if necessary, impeaching a critical witness at trial, i.e. Caleb Williams. Here's what the defense team argued. Good morning, and may it please the court. This court should reverse the conviction below for three reasons. First, the district court applied a test the U.S. Supreme Court has already determined is unconstitutional in denying Mr. Duggar the opportunity to present a complete defense. Caleb Williams, for context, had worked at Wholesale Motor Cars, which was the scene of the alleged crime, Caleb Williams was listed on a sales contract as the salesperson approximately six weeks earlier. He regularly used the only computer at issue, the HP PC computer, for purposes that had nothing to do with wholesale motor cars or Josh Duggar. He used it to print shipping labels for eBay sales personally. He texted Mr. Duggar on May 7th, approximately a week before the alleged crimes, offering to, quote, watch the lot the following week. He spent the night one mile away from the lot, at a car lot, by the way, two days later on May 9th of 2019. He took a photo of Mr. Duggar in the office where the alleged crime occurred, of Mr. Duggar using a MacBook laptop in the car lot office, not the HP computer at issue, and he concealed all metadata in the documents that he provided to the government when investigators finally, at the 11th hour just before trial, did any investigation well, as to him. My understanding is that the district court didn't preclude you or your client from calling Mr. Williams. It was just a threshold showing of a nexus between, I guess, a time and a place nexus. Is that correct? No, Your Honor. What the district court did is the district court expressly said that we could call Mr. Williams for a very limited purpose. We could ask him whether he had knowledge or recollection of being present on the lot between May 13th and May 16th, and whether he remoted in. But what the district court next said is critical, and this is on page 1364 of volume six of the transcript. He said, if he says he wasn't there and didn't remote in, in other words, if he denies committing the crime for which Mr. Duggar was on trial, quote, that's as far as you're going to get. And he further explained that he would not permit impeachment based on Mr. Williams's uh, prior felony conviction for a crime against a child, a sex crime against a child. But isn't that exactly what Judge Kobus just asked you, that there was an insufficient nexus unless he, he um, admitted on the, you know, on the stand that he was actually there or had remoted in or had some connection to that computer? Your Honor, I don't believe so, and I'll tell you the reason why. The day before this sidebar at trial happened, there was a critical on-the-record in-chambers conference on this exact issue that sheds light into the test that the district court actually applied. And it was not the insufficient nexus test that applies in the Tenth Circuit and that has never been adopted by this court. But putting that legal issue what's, aside... What's, what's the test that should have been used under Eighth Circuit precedent? The test that should have been used is the test that applied in the Holmes case, which is that you have an absolute constitutional right to present evidence of an alternative perpetrator. That's what the U.S. Supreme Court said. That's binding precedent in this court. But to answer uh, the court's question, uh, Judge Strauss, what the court said, and this is on uh, 
pages 9, 10, and 9, 11 of volume 5, this is that day before hearing, was critical. The court said this concept that the greater the strength of the evidence, in other words, the government's evidence and the court's view on that, quote, that weighs into part of the court's analysis as to whether it will include or permit or exclude that, end quote. And so what the court was saying a day before trial is, Essentially, that the court was looking at this through the lens of if, if the court believes the strength of the government's case is greater, then that decreases the relevance or the appropriateness of admitting this alternative perpetrator testimony. But that's an unconstitutional test. And then the very next day... Why isn't the court simply requiring an appropriate foundation, appropriate evidence for a foundation for testimony that you would have liked to have solicited? Be, precisely because the court articulated the test that was invalidated in Holmes, invalidated in Holmes, as the test that the court was applying, and that's the significant distinction here, and that's the distinction with a difference. This was not a foundation issue, and by the way, as we briefed, there was unambiguously a sufficient nexus. If this court were to hypothetically adopt the Tenth Circuit's rationale, but that like that um, goes only to some of the testimony because I my read of the record is at least with respect to the prior conviction, the district court was quite clear in doing a Rule 403 balancing, and I I basically said that it would it create confusion for the jury, sort of a mini trial, et cetera. And so I don't maybe you have a different view, but I don't think that goes to the to the prior conviction at all. Your Honor, I think it, it goes to the prior conviction insofar as the court was considering at that sidebar and at the men's conference, I'm sorry, at the uh, chamber's conference the day before, the issues combined. Because what the court essentially said was, you can call Caleb Williams and you can ask him under oath, did you commit the crime? And if he says no, you're done. No lawyer in their right mind is going to call a witness to say that and then have to sit down without so what, the ability what was, to impeach what that What was the evidence that you wanted to get in? The evidence that linked Mr. Williams as an alternative perpetrator, specifically that he places himself regularly, and the evidence places him regularly at the car lot or near the car lot, using the computer that was the only computer, despite many electronic devices and computers being seized, that had alleged child pornography on it, that Mr. Williams specifically texted Mr. Duggar on May 7th, and we wanted to authenticate that text through Mr. Williams, offering to, quote, watch the lot, end quote, during the time period, or at least very close in time to the time period that this crime occurred. And at that point, the district court effectively deprived Mr. Duggar of that ability. It was not our burden, it would be burden shifting, to prove that Mr. Williams committed any crime. So was it takeaway of the evidence that, that you wanted to... It admitted basically that he had access to computer? It, what we wanted to get admitted was that he had access to the computer, familiarity with the computer, access to the car lot, and that the government failed to prove Mr. Duggar guilty beyond a reasonable doubt by failing to rule out Mr. Williams as an alternative perpetrator. And it's a reasonable doubt analysis that's key. The burden always remains on the prosecution here and everywhere. That's not only what the law allows, but what the Constitution requires. And that's what the Supreme Court emphasized in the Holmes case. And that's what's so troubling about what's clear in the record here. There's no ambiguity about what the court did. The court articulated the test both the day before and at sidebar that the court was applying. Here's the government's rebuttal. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Josh Handel for the United States. Um, I'll begin with the alternative perpetrator um, evidence and the, the Caleb Williams issue. So uh, there was no error in the district court's ruling on the hypothetical testimony of Caleb Williams. I think it's helpful to remember at the outset what the undisputed lay of the land is here. Everyone agreed at trial that the partitioned section of Mr. Duggar's computer, which was the part of the computer containing all of the child's material, where all of the child's Material evidence was recovered, had to have been installed by someone who is physically present at Mr. Duggar's computer on May 13th, 2019. There was no evidence that Mr. Williams was present on Mr. Duggar's car lot or even in the state of Arkansas on that date. To the contrary, partition section, refresh my recollection, was that generally available to anyone using the computer or was it protected in some way? No, Your Honor, it was um, password protected by the password Intel 1988 that Mr. Duggar had used for years across a number of accounts. Yes. Um, 
and uh, to, to the contrary, there was um, abundant evidence. All the available evidence indicated that Mr. Williams was not present in Arkansas on that date um, or any other date relevant to the conduct here. Mr. Williams told, uh, I believe, both sides' investigators that he was not there on that date. He was outside Arkansas between May 11th and May 16th. And the government proffered that it had receipts, videos, and, if necessary, live testimony from multiple witnesses confirming that Mr. Williams was outside Arkansas for that entire period. Now, notwithstanding that uncontroverted evidence placing Mr. Williams elsewhere, the district court did give Mr. Duggar a wide berth to elicit relevant testimony. The court told Mr. Duggar that he could call Mr. Williams to the stand. Upon doing so, Mr. Duggar would have been allowed to ask Mr. Williams about any fact to which Mr. Williams was a percipient witness, including Mr. Williams's dates of employment at the car lot, his prior experience with the computer, his contacts and text messages with Mr. Duggar. I believe at um, record document 156, page 21, the district court goes through all of the different aspects that Mr. Duggar would have been permitted to ask Mr. Williams about if he had called him to the stand. Um, he also would have been permitted to lay a factual foundation for Mr. Williams's personal knowledge of or involvement in the relevant conduct, including by asking whether Mr. Williams was present at the car lot between May 13th and 16th, and whether he had ever remotely accessed Mr. Duggar's computer. The sole limitation that the district court imposed was that if Mr. Williams testified that he was not present between May 13th and 16th, and that he had never remotely accessed Mr. Duggar's computer, the defense would not then be allowed to impugn Mr. Williams as an alternative perpetrator based solely on his unrelated prior sex offense. That limitation was consistent with at least four lines of authority. Number one, with Federal Rule of Evidence 602, which limits admissible testimony to only those matters where, quote, evidence is introduced sufficient to support a finding that the witness has personal knowledge of the matter. Here, there was no evidentiary foundation for Mr. Williams' presence at the car lot or remote access to the computer on the relevant dates, except that which Mr. Williams might provide through his own testimony. The district court appropriately permitted Mr. Duggar to try to lay such a foundation through Mr. Williams' testimony, but it made clear that if Mr. Williams testified in such a way that did not lay a foundation for his presence or his access, then there would be no basis to continue with that line of questioning. The court's limitation was also consistent with its gatekeeping role under Federal Rule of Evidence 403, which permits the district court to exclude even relevant evidence that would create unfair prejudice, confuse the issues, or mislead the jury. And that's especially the case because that conviction carries no obvious value as impeachment evidence in these circumstances. It is not an offense involving a dishonest act or false statement. It does not place Mr. Williams in proximity to Mr. Duggar's computer on any relevant date. And it does not suggest his technical capacity to have installed the partition or remotely accessed the computer. The court's limitation was also consistent with the Supreme Court's decision in Holmes versus South Carolina. Now, I believe my friend on the other side suggested that um, Holmes set down the principle that uh, defendants have an absolute constitutional right to introduce alternative perpetrator evidence. In fact, Holmes expressly approved the principle that alternative perpetrator evidence, quote, may be excluded where it does not sufficiently connect the other person to the crime, as, for example, where the evidence is speculative or remote, end quote. Counsel, the, the, I'll tell you exactly what concerns me. The district court made an error of law in one respect. The district court said the critical inquiry concerns the strength of the prosecution's case. And when I was reading when I was reading the materials in this case, my eyes just about you know you know bugged out of my head because I'm like that is clearly wrong. It's not it's not the case that a stronger prosecution case means you can exclude all alternative perpetrator evidence. So what I'm trying to figure out is did that infect the rest of the district court's analysis on alternative perpetrator? Absolutely, Your Honor. So a, a couple of points on that. Um, we acknowledged in our brief, um, as did the district court below, that during one of the times that this was addressed at trial, the district court inadvertently read the wrong passage from Holmes into the record. Um, I would point out that the district court stated the correct principle the day before when it said, quote, there has to be some demonstrable nexus of proof that links the alternative perpetrator to the crime, end quote. The district court, um, or, or I'm sorry, the Supreme Court in Holmes also never 
said that you cannot consider the strength of the prosecution's evidence. It just says that you can't solely consider the strength of the prosecution's case. Obviously, the strength of the prosecution's case is, in some respects, relevant to the probative versus prejudicial balancing test that Rule 403 um, instructs district courts to engage in. But um, just to kind of uh, allay your concerns about um, the, the one instance where the district court read the wrong passage of Holmes, the court also contemporaneously, right in the same section of transcript, contemporaneously quoted decisions applying the correct principle. And this is at... Um, the trial transcript, volume 6, page 1362, where the district court describes as the, quote, money quote, um, the, the Tenth Circuit's holding that a, a non-speculative nexus between the crime charged and the alleged perpetrator is a threshold requirement for alternative perpetrator evidence. And finally, the district court explained post-trial that its misstatement was inadvertent and did not reflect a misunderstanding of the applicable principle. That's at record document 156, pages 19 through 20. I don't believe Mr. Duggar has ever expressly contended that the district court was uh, misrepresenting its, uh, its recollection or um, its understanding of the law. We certainly see no basis in the record for making that kind of conclusion. The second issue on appeal is whether the district court erred by denying Duggar's motion to suppress statements after a federal agent physically stopped him from contacting his attorney and subsequently interrogated him outside the presence of his counsel. Here's what the defense team argued. The second issue is that of suppression. And in this particular instance, federal agents made a beeline after doing surveillance, waiting for Josh Duggar to appear at wholesale motor cars to execute a search warrant. They swarm in in six law enforcement vehicles. They're wearing ballistic vests and they're armed, and they make a beeline, two of them, directly towards Mr. Duggar. At that point, he takes out his phone, physically puts it to his ear, and there is no factual dispute in the record below and in the trial court below, both at the suppression hearing and the trial testimony, that Mr. Duggar lifted his phone to his ear for the precise purpose of contacting his legal counsel. What federal agents did is they physically took the phone out of his hand and from that point forward deprived him of the ability to communicate with his legal counsel, as was his constitutional right. Was there a phone up on the premises? Any uh, other phone on the premises? There's no, no evidence at all in the record of phones that were either not seized. There were other phones, Your Honor, that were seized by law enforcement, for example, from um, other people that were present at the car lot. Was there any statement by the officers that he could not make contact with them or that that was prohibited? There was no express statement, Your Honor, I don't believe. However, there was no physical mechanism for him to contact He counsel. was told he was free to go. Is that correct? The testimony at the trial below and at the suppression hearing was that he was told he was free to go. But no, that's not the test. No reasonable person sitting in his shoes at that time would believe that their freedom of movement was not. Did, did he seek to go to an adjacent business or someplace else to make a phone call? No, Your Honor. And the reason why, and this is undisputed in the record, is that as the court found as a factual finding, obviously subject to significant deference by this court, is that this lot was accessible only by a four-lane divided highway with no sidewalk. It was, quote, in the middle of nowhere, end quote. That's the district court's finding. And what's critical about that is there was nowhere to go. So the notion that, you know, if what is essentially being pictured is this, you know, car lot in like a, you know, a, a car mall, if you will, that's the exact opposite of what this was. This is a used car lot in the middle of nowhere, that's literally accessible with a highway with no sidewalk. He had no. Phone. He explicitly invoke his right to counsel, though, and say, "Hey, I don't want. You know, I want to. I want to call counsel. I don't want to answer any questions." Your Honor, I believe he did explicitly invoke his right to counsel, and it was undisputed that that's what the agent understood his attempt to do. I actually think it's, if there is a such thing, Your Honor, it's more than actually invoking the right to counsel when you physically try to contact counsel, and when law enforcement literally 
prevents you from doing so by interfering with the mechanism that you're using to contact counsel. That's, that's one step even greater than some of the court's prior jurisprudence of, you know, is it a clear invocation? You know, was it, maybe I should talk to a lawyer, maybe I shouldn't. This was literally an attempt. I'm calling my lawyer and the agent saying, no, you're not, and physically taking the object counsel, from his hand. You don't, you don't contest the fact that the warrant authorized the officers to seize the phone. No, Your Honor. So, so your suggestion is here, the Constitution will require them to wait until he finishes phone call and then seize it? No, Your Honor. The Constitution does not require them to wait and to seize it, but the Constitution, after the invocation of counsel, requires them not to interrogate him until his lawyer is physically present. So the issue is not about the seizure but there of the wasn't an, uh, an, is Where is, in the record, is there an actual invocation of the right to counsel? When... Uh, the special agent who testified at the suppression hearing expressly admitted in no uncertain terms that Mr. Duggar was taking his phone out to, and articulated that he was calling his lawyer. I believe that's as clear an invocation of the right to counsel as you could possibly have. I am calling my lawyer. That's an invocation of the right to counsel. That's not vague. And it wasn't misunderstood by the agent either. The agent, to his credit, admitted that under oath at the suppression do have, hearing. Do you have presidential authority for that act being... Um, clear statement of invocation? No, Your Honor. And one of the things that's really interesting here is that of all of the cases involving the invocation of the right to counsel and the issues that are before this court, this is the only case that I could find, there may be other cases out there, but it's the only case that I could find where an individual was physically in the act of contacting counsel and was physically stopped by law enforcement from doing so. That's a unique fact pattern. That's a unique situation. It's not surprising that that doesn't happen or hasn't happened historically, at least to, to the extent of further litigation. But did Mr. Duggar state to the police officers, I, I want my attorney before I will talk to you? I, I, this is... In those words, no, Your Honor, but I believe by stating I'm calling my lawyer and physically doing it, that's a clear invocation of the right to counsel. I don't think there was any ambiguity, and to the agent's credit, no one has suggested at all at the trial court below, at suppression or at any point, that this was an, ambigu an ambiguous invocation of the right to counsel. But all of this, in terms of the suppression, uh, depends on him being in custody under our Griffin factors. And what's the best, in your view, other than the fact that it's remote and other, the, other than the fact they came in with these ballistic vests, what's your best argument that he's in custody despite the fact they told him he wasn't in custody? Your Honor, under the what the Griffin court says is non-exhaustive Griffin factors, but the factors that have been used, as the court pointed out, for approximately 30 years, plus or minus. Mm -hmm. The best arguments that he was in custody is this context under Miranda's version of, of custody. Do you, do, would a reasonable person believe that he's free to leave? Did he but, have a vehicle to depart in? No, Your Honor. The vehicle that he came in was seized, or was it wasn't seized, it was searched, and so he had no access to it. And all the keys to the other vehicles at the car lot were in the office where law enforcement was, was uh, physically at. And there's actually testimony that he wouldn't have been allowed to enter any of those buildings without an escort. That's on page 31 of the suppression hearing. And so what's significant here, Your Honor, is that these agents are wearing ballistic vests. They're armed. The circumstance is such that when he invokes, or at least what we believe is invokes his right to counsel, they're coming at him, making a beeline towards him, and physically stopping him from contacting his attorney. That's what no reasonable person would sit there and say, police regularly grab my hand. That's kind of analogous to what someone would think if your hands are grabbed, that you are being placed under arrest. And in that instance, I think that under Griffin, which of course is, is a case-specific analysis here on de novo review, that what this court should find is that he was actually in custody. Here's the government's rebuttal. So the district court correctly declined to suppress Mr. Duggar's voluntary statements to agents Faulkner and Acock because Mr. Duggar was not in custody at any point during the search of his used car lot. For over 30 years, this court has considered the same six Griffin factors to decide whether an interview was custodial. On pages 24 through 30 of our brief, we went through all of those factors and explained why each supports the district court's finding that Mr. Duggar was not in custody. I want to focus on just two um, that I think are particularly salient to the analysis in this case. So number one, Mr. Duggar was repeatedly told that he was not in custody and was free to leave. Of course, the incantation of that 
or statement of that incantation, you're free to go, is not by itself always sufficient if there are other circumstances that indicate a person really isn't free. That's true, Your Honor. I agree that those are not magic words that could otherwise excuse extremely egregious custodial circumstances or something like that. I would note, however, that in the Zecre case, which we cite in our brief, you said that, quote, no governing precedent of the Supreme Court or this court holds that a person was in custody after being clearly advised of his freedom to leave or terminate questioning. So if they aren't magic words, they're about as close as we can come under the prevailing precedent. But here, I think it's important that the agents didn't just kind of say this as a general prophylactic and leave it at that. Mr. Duggar was advised meaningfully on at least three separate occasions that he was not under arrest and was free to leave. First, when the agents approached him and informed him that they were there to execute a search warrant rather than an arrest warrant and he was free to leave, he even engaged in a little bit of back and forth with them, explained to the agents that his wife was pregnant and was expecting soon and that he may have to leave in order to contact her and the agents said that's perfectly fine. Second, when Mr. Duggar was presented with the statement of rights forms at the outset of his conversation with the agents and the agents, in fact, manually edited that form at Mr. Duggar's request to remove the phrase into custody, which is kind of the standard language that they put on that form. Mr. Duggar was somewhat bothered by the phrase into custody and so they said, all right, we'll edit that, we'll cross that out. And finally, when Mr. Duggar indicated to the agents that he would, quote, leave here sooner rather than later and they again reiterated that it was his decision whether and when to leave the scene. And that brings us to the second of the Griffin factors that I think is especially relevant to this case, which is that Mr. Duggar did leave the scene of his own volition at a time of his choosing and without being arrested. This court has considered circumstances that are candidly much closer to the custodial line but found no custodial interrogation where the interaction terminated without an arrest. So in the Mullenbrook case that we cited at page 30 of our brief, the suspect was transported in a police car from his home to the station and questioned in a small windowless interrogation room behind closed doors. And this court determined that that was not a custodial interrogation because at the end of the interrogation, the police drove him back home and he was not arrested. Here, Mr. Duggar voluntarily ended the interview. He left his employee, Randall Berry, in charge of the lot for the rest of the search, and he departed under his own power. He was, in fact, not arrested until almost a year and a half later. So I think those two factors, you know, as we pointed out in our brief, we think that all six of the Griffin factors favor the government here and clearly foreclose any contention that Mr. Duggar was in custody, but certainly the fact that he was repeatedly advised that he was not in custody, repeatedly advised that he was free to leave at any time, and that he then availed himself of that liberty and left the lot at a time of his choosing without needing the officers to drive him, without even needing them to move their cars, without needing any assistance from the officers. I think that that clearly forecloses any contention that this was a custodial interrogation. You know, I am a little concerned, though. I mean, I get the point on custody. I asked opposing counsel about it, but I'm a little concerned when you know apparently the agent knew that he was trying to call his counsel, and it appears that might have been the only way he could have done so. And so it does concern me when somebody makes an attempt to contact counsel, come in, swoop away the phone, even if it's pursuant to the warrant, and then is unable then to call counsel because there's no alternative way to do it. I mean, that does create, I mean, I understand that this was a weird situation, but I've never seen that before. Sure. So, Judge Strauss, I think a couple of points on that. First, it's not clear from the record whether there was another way to contact counsel. Mr. Duggar was on the scene with two companions, one employee and one possibly friend. They, I believe, at least one of them, it's in the record that he had a cell phone that was not seized by officers as part of the evidence that they collected and transported from the scene. I think that the record just reflects that his cell phone was, they call it like a manual inspection by the officers. So, first of all, as a threshold matter, it's not abundantly clear that there was no other phone available that he could use. But even if we assume that that's the case, Mr. Duggar's method of contacting his lawyer, which 
again, he ultimately availed himself of, was leaving the scene. And once again, the officers told him repeatedly he was free to leave the scene. When they first started their conversation with him, they said, you don't have to talk to us. You don't have to talk to us without a lawyer present. You can, you know, we can do this later once you've had a chance to talk to a lawyer. I mean, I think all of that shows that he was, he had an option to speak to a lawyer, even though obviously the officers had appropriately seized his phone at the outside of their search. I know that Mr. Gelfand did not have a chance to address this. I'm happy to answer any questions about the metadata issue or the expert testimony. I did just, you know, very briefly want to say that while I'd be happy to discuss why the district court appropriately exercised its discretion when delimiting this testimony, really the photographic metadata issue is much ado about nothing here because text messages from Mr. Duggar's iPhone, the accuracy of which has never been challenged. He has never challenged the accuracy of the text messages either in the district court or in his appellate briefing. Those messages independently placed Mr. Duggar at the scene of the crime on dates of offense conduct without reference to any photographic metadata. And just to very briefly go through a couple examples, on May 14th, when the law enforcement program Torrential Downpour detects that Mr. Duggar's IP address was uploading child sex material, that alert happens at 542 p.m. At 549 p.m., Mr. Duggar's iPhone sent a text message reading, quote, at my car lot, end quote. On May 15th, at 1115 a.m., Mr. Duggar's iPhone sends a text message reading, quote, I'm at my car lot now, end quote. 20 minutes later, at 11.35 a.m., child sexual abuse material is downloaded on the partition section of Mr. Duggar's computer. And later that day, at 5.08 p.m., Mr. Duggar's iPhone sends a text message reading, quote, I'm here at the car lot, will be here till around 6 or so, end quote. 14 minutes later, at 5.22 p.m., child sexual abuse material is downloaded on the partition. So even if you were to set aside all of the photographic metadata in its entirety, uncontroverted evidence, specifically Mr. Duggar's own words in his text messages, places him at the car lot in close temporal proximity to the criminal conduct here. Unless the court has further questions, I'll rest on our brief and respectfully request that you affirm the judgment below. Thank you. When you have hard times and all others are gone, I will be there when the troubles have come. Through sunshine or rain, when no help can be found, things may seem hopeless, but just look around. I'll be there to the end with you. I'll do my best to be faithful and true. Through the hardest of days, we will choose the right way. My commitment I'll prove. Yes, I will be loyal to you.